A ceasefire was announced yesterday between Houthi rebels and the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, with today marking the one year since Saudi Arabia began its military intervention in Yemen. This comes days after a U.S. airstrike killed as many as 50 people in the country's southeast. What is it that the Saudis and the United States and, of course, the people of Yemen want to achieve with this new agreement? We are joined by Daniel Patrick Welsh, a political commentator from Boston. And we are joined from Toronto by Zafar Bengash. He is on the editorial board of the Crescent International. Zafar, let me start with you. How do you react to the news? It's been one year of intense bombing, intense fighting. Is the ceasefire, is the possibility of peace, is it real? Well, to start with, I would say that um, it is welcome news, but uh, I wouldn't hold too much hope in it yet uh, because the Saudis have been bombing that poor country for a year, as you said, and they have caused massive amounts of damage. They have destroyed the infrastructure. Thousands of people have been killed. 22 million Yemenis are on the verge of starvation. But the objectives for which the Saudis launched their war of aggression on Yemen uh, has not been achieved. And that was, of course, to install their own puppet, Abdul Rab Hadi Mansour, back in power. So the Saudis have totally failed in their objective. And now they are trying to find a way out of the of the mess that they've got themselves into. We must keep in mind that the Houthis are very good fighters. They are poorly armed, but they are very determined people, and they are not going to allow outsiders to dictate to them as to who their ruler should be. And they have shown through their resistance over the year that they can withstand the onslaught of not only the Saudis, but at least 10 or 12 of their allies that have been bombing them day and day in and day out. And of course, with support from the United States and a number of other countries. Let me bring Daniel Patrick Welsh into the discussion. Daniel, uh, Zafar Bangash has the opinion that the Saudis have succeeded only in creating a lot of human suffering in Yemen, but have failed in terms of their military and political objectives, which was to create a proxy government that could rule the country on their behalf, and that they're now looking for a way out, that this ceasefire agreement is a way to get out without losing face. And I noticed that the U.S. State Department, of course, also said the ceasefire was very much uh, welcome, uh, in keeping with U.S. interests in Yemen. What's your take? Yeah, I think I'd, I think I'd agree with Zafar, uh, uh, more or less. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's the U.S. and its proxies are masters at um, crying uncle just before the, uh, the the final bell. You know, the fact is the Saudis are getting the crap beaten out of them. They can have this this poor country on the verge of starvation, but they still can't do anything except for create misery from the air. They can't get anywhere in terms of what they're doing. The the Houthis have then uh, come and, and attacked them within Saudi Arabia. They've, they've had uh, massive military failure. And so this is a, a way of saving face. It's a way of giving up without uh, without saying you lost. Exactly the, what the U.S. did in Syria. Exactly the same uh, you know philosophical concept. You know, uh, we'll finish uh, killing women and children because we're good guys instead of, like, <laughs> we're losing. You know, it, it's a common thing. There's another thing I wanted to add, though, which is for the Americans, it's very important that this be a peace year. You know, the this whole election uh, BS uh, in this, like, faux democracy that we have going on here is enhanced by pretending that there's a dime's worth of difference between the foreign policy of the Republicans and the Democrats. So they want to have this rapprochement with Cuba. They want to have a ceasefire in Syria. They want to have a ceasefire in Yemen just to give the veneer that um, something is actually happening and Obama can uh, retire with his peace prize intact. That was Daniel Patrick Welsh. We want to ask Zafar Bangash from the editorial board of the Crescent International in Toronto. Daniel you know, essentially agrees with your your assessment. He also makes the point that the United States has an interest in trying to appear to be the peacemaker right now during 2016 at the same time as the country's normalizing or sort of normalizing relations with Cuba and after the Iran nuclear arms agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan. But aside from U.S. calculations or anyone's calculations for narrow political purposes – 
I would like to ask you to put Yemen's position in a sort of a geostrategic understanding because of its geography, because of where it is, and also help the audience understand this very seemingly complicated civil war, like who are the players and how does it impact on big global politics? You see, Yemen is extremely uh, important strategically. It controls the entrance to the Red Sea and also uh, the fact that that is the other sea lane for export of oil from the region. One, of course, is the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormoz. The other is through the Red Sea. And because uh, because Yemen sits in that strategic region, uh, obviously, everybody would like to take control of that. Within the Saudi uh, calculations, they cannot afford to lose that because then that would make them completely dependent on their export of oil through the Strait of Hormoz, over which they have no control, over which Iran has virtually complete control. And that is something that the Saudis uh, are, are not prepared to accept. Secondly, there has been a a proposal or in fact something on the drawing boards that the Saudis are pushing for a Hadramut pipeline. That means that um, oil flowing from there should go through the Hadramut region of uh, Yemen into uh, the Red Sea uh, region so that they could export it uh, there. So in terms of uh, Yemen's strategic importance, it is absolutely uh, a very, very uh, strategic region and, and country. In terms of the internal dynamics, um, uh, of course, you know, it it is the Saudis would love to present it as an internal war or a civil war. But uh, the fact is that uh, the Houthis have been able to withstand the Saudi onslaught for a whole year. And a number of other tribes in Yemen have now rallied together because they have started to see Houthis not only as one faction, but as very patriotic Yemenis that are standing up for the rights of all the Yemeni people. So in that sense, I don't think that it is a tribal war. What it is, is in fact an internal Saudi war because the Saudi king, King Salman, wants or wanted to project his own son, Mohammed bin Salman, who happens to be the defense minister as well as the deputy crown prince. The king would like to have his own son, Mohammed bin Salman, to succeed him as the king. And of course, there is internal rivalry going on inside Saudi Arabia in the ruling family. And this uh, adventure or misadventure, I should say, in Yemen has actually gone badly for the Saudi rulers because they thought they are going to they are going to subdue Yemen in a matter of a few weeks, if not sooner. And that therefore that would be a major cap in a major feather in the cap of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. But that is not how things have worked out. In fact, uh, Saudi failure in, in Syria, Saudi failure in Yemen, Saudi failure in Iraq are all going to contribute to the uh, downfall of the Saudi dynasty, in fact, which I've predicted for over a year now that this dynasty is on its way out. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, anachronistic. They really do not represent anybody. They don't represent the people of Saudi Arabia. They have caused a lot of chaos, not only in the region, but throughout the world. And the sooner they are got rid of, the better the region would be and the better the world would be. Okay, let me uh, ask you, Daniel. Zafar is making the point that the Saudi government is internally riven with contradictions that its failure in Iraq and Syria and now in Yemen means that the the government itself, the royal family, which has been a linchpin, especially for U.S. strategy in that part of the Middle East, that it has the possibility of coming undone as a consequence of of its failure in Yemen. I mean, Ronald Reagan said in the early 1980s, there will be no revolution in the Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. This was after the Iranian revolution of 1979, meaning that the United States uh, government itself would make sure that the Saudi royal family, because of its strategic importance to the United States, that it would not fall, would not fall. Is that still true? Well, I would take a more sanguine view. Yeah, I, I, I'm obviously it's driven with internal contradictions, and these are huge losses. Uh, it, but it, you know, they just have so much, uh, so much power, and so much control, and so much money. It's just hard to imagine that um, in, in, a revolution could actually succeed. But 
Um, that is another uh, reason behind the scenes for the ceasefire. It is, it's a very scary thing. Like, they just can't do it all. They can't maintain the level of um, full-spectrum dominance that the U.S. needs and wants from its proxies. So they've pulled their fat out of the fire, so to speak, and try to kind of uh, consolidate because they have trouble at home. That makes perfect sense. Now, what it really amounts to is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, or actually between the U.S. and Iran, uh, or the U.S. and the rest of the world. You know, and so I think that that's all going on in in the background, obviously as well. It's very it's strategically important peninsula. Um, for international uh, shipping routes and everything like that. So um, the, the the bottom line is, I I just I was smiling when you were telling me because I thought, wow, that'd be great. <laughs> you know, that's, that sounds like that's that's like uh, the beginning of the next phase of the global revolution. But I I'm skeptical. I don't think that it's as um, imminent as it it seems on some fronts. Zafar, you know, we're we're talking again, and I will stay with us for another minute or two about the the stability of the Saudi government. If it is, as you and Daniel Daniel say, a real setback, the fact that they were unable to establish not just a a, a proxy, but a, any sort of pacification of Yemen, and in fact that they have lost the war in terms of what their objectives were. You're predicting that the Saudi monarchy could fall. Daniel is more sanguine about it. He says, well, there's too powerful that he'd like to like to see them fall, perhaps, but it's not realistic. Now, in the last uh, between May and September uh, 2015, the United States sold seven point eight billion dollars more in weapons to the Saudi monarchy. Uh, obviously, that's very good for U.S. business, but it, it does seem to be also an expression of confidence in the tenacity of the Saudi monarchy in spite of whatever its decrepit sort of internal or bankrupt features may be. What do you think about that? You see, the Saudi army and troops are so incompetent that if they can't even fight against the lightly armed Houthis, I'm not sure exactly what those weapons are good for. I mean, you know, they can buy billions and billions of dollars worth of weapons but they are not really um coming uh, being very uh, they're not very useful for them you see inside saudi arabia uh number one there are at least uh, according to one estimate at least 15000 political prisoners according to another estimate at least 40000 political prisoners that means there is a lot of discontent inside saudi arabia what was the Saudi um, uh, modus operandi in the past? They would throw money at people that they, they would just buy their loyalty. Now, as a consequence of their misadventures in Syria and Yemen, for instance, the Yemeni war cost them something like, um, uh, you know, they have $6 billion uh, per month. Now, that's a lot of money to, to waste. The IMF has said that the Saudis are going to be out of their, <clears throat> sorry, out of their reserves in a matter of five years. Now, because of uh, declining oil prices because of discontent internally, uh, the Saudis are no, lo- no longer able to buy the people's loyalties. Now, you see, although on the one hand, we see that the, the U.S. is um, selling them a lot of weapons, which obviously the uh, arms merchants are very happy about, but we also need to keep in mind that only last week, uh, there was a um, uh, President Obama gave an interview to the Atlantic magazine to to Jeffrey Goldberg and telling uh, telling him, in fact, he was very critical of the Saudi regime, telling the Saudi regime that they had better uh, shape up because they are the instigators of all of this instability and terrorism in the region. Obama also told them that they had better get start getting along with their neighbors, whether they like them or not. I think these are pretty strong words coming from the president of the United States publicly, which indicates a lot of frustration within the U.S. But I think ultimately the fact that the Saudi regime is unable to buy the loyalty of its people, that it's extremely weak, its hold on power is weak. And secondly, I believe that the U.S. probably has lined up maybe two, three other sort of, you know, groups or factions within Saudi Arabia that are, that are likely to take over. So if this family falls, it does not mean that Saudi Arabia goes out of the orbit of U.S. influence. It's just that there will be a change of faces over there and the U.S. will still continue to control it minus this family.
Daniel Patrick Walsh, the Zafar has made the point that, of course, the Saudi monarchy may not completely fall, but the current regime might be shifted. And there's, there's a growing sort of skepticism in even public rebuke by the Obama administration of the Saudi monarchy, as evidenced by Obama's interview recently in, in the Atlantic magazine. But I want to also ask you, and we only have about two minutes left, maybe two minutes, 30 seconds. At the same time that the bombing took place in Belgium, the terrible uh, atrocity that ISIS took uh, credit for, at the same time, the United States government the dr- sent drones and carried out a bombing that they said was against al-Qaeda militants, but more than 50 or perhaps 60 people died. So, of course, everyone who dies in a U.S. drone attack is immediately labeled as an al-Qaeda militant. But what's the U.S. drone policy in Yemen likely to to do in terms of its impact on public opinion, or does it have any impact at all in terms of the military equation? Well, I mean, you saw, obviously, there's a total media blackout, basically, that there was this huge outcry about what happened in Belgium and nary a peep about what the U.S. is doing, in, in, and not just in Yemen, and, and, and not just... Um, not just against only uh, targets that they claim are terroristic. There are, you know, the, the drone program in general um, is, you know, something like only 10% um, effective in terms of uh, t- uh, targeting non-civilian casualties. It's, 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 a, it's a murderous, a, a, a sick and disgusting program. It's, it's just translating Guantanamo to the air. You know, he's, uh, Obama basically upsold uh, Guantanamo instead of closing it and, and did a much better job at it than George Bush. And so I don't know, why would it be any different than what the Saudis have done? These are airstrikes against a huge area, mountainous area, the oldest, uh, you know, one of the oldest cultures on earth. Uh, it, 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 it's not going to have much military impact. I think it is because they, uh, first of all, these kind of the, the neocons who have the a throttle hold on, on U.S. foreign policy actually believe their hype. They really do believe that the, the drone program is effective, and that's why no, no candidate running for, to replace the, uh, Obama will say that they're going to shut it down. Um, the, the other thing is that um, they have always used this as a kind of genie that they can put in and take out of the bottle. We'll bomb al-Qaeda in uh, in in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, but we'll try to help them along in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, wherever we need it to uh, to vent our venom to make it look the way we want. It's a, it's a we're very- gonna we're gonna have to let Daniel Patrick Welsh have the the last word. We've been talking about Yemen. We've been joined by Daniel Patrick Welsh from Boston and from Zafar Bangash. He's the editorial board of the Crescent International from Toronto. You are listening to Loud and Clear. We'll be back. The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The noble messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is revered and loved by all Muslims. But there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known. And that is the treaties he entered into, as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sira, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International. P.O. Box 747, Gorbley, Ontario, L0H1G0. Or call us, 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. 